everybody and welcome. This is Mark Newton. I am the head of technical strategy for FS Insight and Funstrat. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's November and a lot of craziness around the world as well as in our own markets. So we will try to attack uh, and really cover as much as we can uh, in the next 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, hang tight and let's get going. And I just want to talk initially about some of the questions you asked. I think they're very relevant and I will share my screen and that will make it easier. And initially, you know, you said which areas look favorable and which ones should be avoided through year end. Now, you know, my thinking is to, to answer it short and sweet, uh, I love industrials and technology, likely in that order. And I think that uh, metals and mining would be a third, but I think that's really going to be probably one of the better areas over the next month into December is going to be metals and mining. I actually have a little bit of a negative forecast between really mid-November into early December. And when I view the S&P, uh, it's been a very healthy bounce today. And really for this week, we're, we, it's really the, the, the best performing week we've seen now for the entire year, which is up 4% based on today's move. Uh, for this week. So an incredible move. But as you can see, we do have some technical challenges. This is S&P, of course, and the broader markets are far weaker when we look at value line and other gauges like that, which still are at really yearly lows and have not really rebounded sufficiently. Um, so this is the RSP and value line looks very similar. When we take a look at that, we see that really you know, we have managed to reclaim that. That's a temporary positive. But in general, we're still very much trending down. And that could be an issue, I think, um, over the next four to six weeks. And so, you know, I do think we rally. For those that are, that are subscribers and clients, you know that we've talked about reasons why the market can bottom and, and should have bottomed last week. And not only in treasuries, but in equities. I think that's right. However, I think our rally likely lasts until about next Thursday, Friday. And even then it likely should not be in a straight line. So I think we've already had a huge move off the lows from last Friday. I think we're likely to stall out. Uh, important job number tomorrow. If it comes in stronger, of course, yields could start to push back higher. We might retreat a little bit in equities, but in general, it's a very strong move. I, I do favor being long. My targets for S&P uh, we're really right up above 4,300, up near 4,330 to 4,360. And a lot of reasons for that based on Fibonacci, based on GAN, based on a lot of reasons. But we can just see that this green trend line hits right near 4,400. I think it's going to be very difficult to take out in the month of November if what I'm thinking is correct. And if anything, <clears throat> in any sort of pullback here to fill the gap from today down to 4,245, should be a buying opportunity, and then we should actually have a sort of an ABC type move. Uh, if we immediately get up above 4393, that would be unusual. But, um, you know, in general, the key, a couple of key things to consider when you talk about what areas are most attractive, industrials versus the S&P has been one of the best sectors uh, overall, maintains an excellent overall intermediate term uh, uptrend. This is equal weight industrials versus equal weighted S&P. So that is really one of my top areas. Uh, I like that quite a bit. Uh, other areas such as financials, I think we can include those for really a shorter term trade between now and year end. Financials, we did get on an equal weighted basis, relative TD sequential and combo monthly buy signals between financials and the S&P. So we've turned up pretty sharply. A lot of people hate the banks and the regionals, and I, I understand that technically. A lot of reasons why those are unattractive, but the insurance stocks should likely remain higher until we get more evidence of rates turning down. I can't really say, even with this violent pullback in rates, that we've that we've actually peaked for the year. And I'll discuss some reasons for that in a minute. So financials, I think, should be good, but I think you have to be a lot more selective. And I listed some of my favorite stocks within the insurance companies and the uh, the exchanges, which are certainly quite strong, as well as some of the credit card companies. I think we have to be selective among the banks. Uh, finally, you know, technology, despite the weakness that we saw in October, still is hanging in there versus the S&P. And so this gives me a lot of optimism, uh, you know, as we've already seen a pretty substantial broader market sell off, no doubt. But yet this is an eco-weighted technology gauge. 
versus an eco-weighted uh, market gauge. And we really have not seen all that much weakness. So, um, you know, that goes to show that, uh, you know, as rates start to turn down, I think, and that happens likely from probably early December into February into next June, July, I think we'll see the majority of the yield compression into that time frame that tech actually can do quite well. And so my thinking is it's right to be in technology. Uh, I don't think the tech has peaked out yet. I sense that uh, for those that are subscribers, you know, I posted something about software versus semis. I think that's interesting. Software is starting to reclaim almost a four year downtrend versus semiconductors and charts of Microsoft, for example, still remain just stellar. And Apple, which is reporting today, I commented on that in last night's piece, and I'll go through a little bit of that in a minute. But bottom line, you know, we had some pretty bearish sentiment readings, and this really reflects what happened in the late last week. Last week, when we bottom was almost a perfect 90 day, 90 degree actually uh, projection from our late July highs. And that's often very important. You almost always want to keep track of those periods 90 and 180 uh, angles of the circle. They tend to be quite important over the years. If you have prominent turning points, if you can run those forward, when you see a confluence, you can find pretty remarkably uh, lots of, of different turns. And so, you know, I use that quite often. And also, you know, when you look at things like, you know, October 13th of last year into July 27th of uh, this year, and you see the length of rallies taking Fibonacci increments and projecting forward, for example, 38.2% of that in time is actually going to hit uh, in about a week and a half. And that also is interesting. So rallies into that likely you're going to face some pretty strong resistance. So, you know, I tend to cover a lot of this stuff in my reports for those that, that uh, know about this, but I would say choose tech, choose industrials, choose financials, choose metals and mining. Those would be my areas to be in. I, I would really avoid playing into the consumer and, and trying to play any sort of counter trend bounce in some of the hardest hit sectors. We know that utilities and REITs and staples have all sort of pushed uh, pull back to almost yearly lows, uh, particularly staples and REITs have been very, very weak. So that's not really an area I want to be in uh, for mean reversion just yet. I think on severe weakness into the end of November, I don't mind that area. But uh, so let's talk about, you know, many, many also ask questions about SMH and semiconductors. I want to cover that real quick. So, you know, we have seen a little bit of weakness. You can't really make much of this pattern since uh, May. If anything, it's very corrective. It's very choppy and overlapping. This honestly is a pretty bullish formation, even though it looks like we're we're going sideways and momentum is slowing in, in all actuality, uh, despite the fact that we broke trends, you know, we haven't really seen much weakness at all. We've attempted to make lower lows, lower highs, but yet very much a choppy type, uh, you know, consolidation pattern. And so this, this normally is great to, to expect that we are going to push back to new highs before any meaningful top. So what I think we have to watch for are the following. So 150 is very important. And of course, 155 above that, then we likely are going to move up to like 170 to 175. And I don't expect that in November. But I think uh, from the middle part of de December into probably late January, I think it is possible to get a stronger rally in the market. And so that would be what to look for. Uh, Nat gas was a question. I want to go through that real quick because we, uh, a lot of obviously strength in natural gas just in the last month, and that's been lacking nearly all year. I tend to like natural gas. I think that, you know, the chart patterns have set up in a fairly bullish manner. Um, you know, normally this time of year, we do get some downward pressure, but I haven't really seen it just yet. If anything, we've seen the opposite. And that really started in the beginning of October. So I'm still favorable towards thinking uh, Natty can push up. Uh, I think we probably do get to four to four and a quarter. I can't say that we're going to have a giant rally, if anything, as we near year end. Uh, crude right now is in a very bearish cycle and same. Normally, most energy will respond to that. So I'm I'm really very careful about longs here. Anything under levels near 327 in front month futures would cause me to really abandon the longs and think we're going to start to pull back. And that hasn't happened yet. How vulnerable is tech to the possible outbreaks of war? Uh, this might have been a question posed way back when. Uh, certainly, we're, we're now in the midst of two wars. So, you know, my only fear is that we could see possible escalation right towards the middle part of November. There's a lot of cycles that I see and a lot of war based cycles that actually get triggered during the time from the 13th to the 17th. I think it's a time of high volatility. 
that is specifically a time when I think that gold and silver should work quite well. So I honestly, you know, one of my top recommendations would be to be long uh, gold. I think that, you know, broader charts of gold remain very constructive over the last couple of years. Nice big bases that have formed since 2020. I think we're going to challenge if not take out those highs. And so initially, you know, what to look for, move back over 20, 2010, 2010 and spot gold should lead up to 2080. 2075 to 2080 is really held as resistance over the last three years. That's going to be really, really important. If that gets exceeded, then my projection is up to 2500. And I think that silver has been lagging. That likely can play catch up at some at some point. But for right now, it's really no preference between the two. They've both been acting pretty similarly. And so we, we hear that a lot of central banks have been buying lots of the metals, China and otherwise, and geopolitical type situations tend to, particularly if there's going to be escalation, uh, tend to be very good for the metals. Also, real rates have started to roll over very sharply in recent days. And I think that's also uh, sort of a, an arrow in the quiver for the bulls. So I like the metals. I like to be long metals and mining stocks. I think that's really a top area. So between now and when we speak next, I expect metals are going to be a lot higher. Uh, so AMD, I'll talk about that real quick. I know this has weakened pretty substantially, um, you know, just since, you know, the, the problem is that we haven't really seen too much. If you just do basic trend analysis, uh, it's been a very choppy pattern. It hasn't really been something that's been all that bearish. I know that for those that have owned it, of course, at 130, uh, it's a disaster to see it go to, to $90. But in general, you know, for those that owned it at 56, 50, so you know, basically this was almost an exact double from the lows of October 22. And so this is really going to be the area of of real importance. We saw a huge volume uh, yesterday. Uh, I think that is a positive. Up above 111 would certainly help this get up to 120. I would just caution that, that you know, this might not immediately move back to highs and it could be choppy. I, I don't mind owning really unless it gets down under $95. And, and given the surge yesterday, that's a, a larger move now percentage wise. But I think we can expect that this probably runs up over the next week and then we can consolidate into the back half of November. I don't mind owning AMD in December and in January uh fibonacci levels on tnx so let's let's talk about the 10 year real quick um you know we've seen a very violent move in the 10 year the way i always use fibonacci both price and time you really want to find major swings between high and low to try to get a feel for that so you know when i look at you know this most recent move uh we are pretty much at the first fib move when you consider you know 0.236 uh, I think this level at 38.2 is a little bit stronger with regards to support because this also marks the highs from 2022 in, in October. And also when you draw trend lines, uh, there's a lot of support that's right near there. So it's really, really difficult for me to say the yields have peaked. And if anything, I'm expecting sort of a choppy decline, you know, a, a bounce from here potentially, and then a further decline that might reach even 450 to 455. And then honestly, I think there's a chance that we push back the highs, which would really surprise a lot of people after the move we've seen. <clears throat> However, uh, trends are still intact. This is anything just short-term uh, you know, noise. We did see a lot of negative divergence momentum wise and this push back the highs, that's always important. But when I look at wave structure of just like TLT, for example, uh, and this is just the 30 year bond, Elliott, that you know we're still within a corrective rally, meaning yields pulling back, which ultimately likely should lead back to lows. And then how this ultimately, I think, probably plays out is it yields, you know, and this is price. So price bottoms probably in the first to second week of December, meaning yields officially peak them. And then we see probably a six to eight month rally, which I think lasts into uh, next year. Now, I want to cover a couple different DeMarc charts that might shed some light on why I'm thinking this. On a monthly chart of TLT, we do have TD sequential, uh, you know, counter trend TD countdown 13 signals buys, but they're not confirmed. And you notice that the combo is on a 12. To get that combo buy, we actually need to decline under 82.43 in TLT. 
You also notice that the setup count is on a five. So ideally that could take as much as three months before that is finalized. So in general, you know, I think we're close, but I can't specifically say that I think the bottom is in. We haven't seen enough pressure. This, this move this week will in fact confirm uh, TD uh, combo buys on a weekly basis. That is very bullish, but I would say the upside is likely going to be limited up to, to 90 or so. I don't really think we, we have a bigger breakout yet in treasuries, and I'll show you why, outside of just the Elliott. Um, here are just some cycles initially, and this is the S&P. For those that are subscribers, you know that you know initially I showed the weakness in November, and, and I didn't even obey my own thing. You know, this, is, this is, of course, amplitude. It's not magnitude. It doesn't have to sell off like that into November, but this, we clearly have seen – uh, the bounce into late October uh, or the sell-off and now the bounce, this actually ends right near the 10th of November, next Friday into the 13th. And then we actually go down pretty sharply into late November. So I'm I'm very skeptical that this rally is just going to be the low and then it's up, up and away. I, I think the, the market has a lot of work to do. And I think that uh, initially, you know, for those that, that don't mind hedging or, 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 you know, like to try to speculate and, and, you know, buying VIX futures or buying puts or this and that. I think that time is next Thursday to Friday. If I had to be, if things happen exactly the way they, they needed to, and they don't always, but that's my S and P cycle chart. It does bottom in early December. It moves back to, honestly, it should at this point move back to close to highs. Uh, we shall see if that happens. Gold turned right on schedule, right in early October, straight up and, even on a minor pullback, I suspect that gold likely is going to be bullish throughout the final uh, couple months of, uh, of the year. So this is my yield cycle chart. And so this is why it gives me a lot of conviction as to why the DeMarc counts sort of being early. Uh, and when I say early, I mean monthly basis, like they're not been, they haven't been confirmed. The wave structure still is, is basically, uh, you know, negative for price bullish on yield. And, you know, this doesn't really peak until the first, second week in December. And the bigger peak happens in February. So this aligns directly with the possibility of that setup count really coming into fruition with the TLT. In plain English, for those that don't look at the mark, I think this yield peaking out is going to be a process. It's not going to be a straight move up to down. And I think we have to be careful about extrapolating too much until we really get down under almost 435 in the 10 year. Um, you know, overall, though, I think between now and next summer, yields are going to move substantially lower. But I don't think that we can say that's going to happen right away based on what we've seen uh, since yesterday. This is a chart for crude oil, and it actually shows a bottom the end of November and then a pretty healthy rally. So I do suspect that crude is going to show further weakness for those that care on Bitcoin. Uh, this one also peak uh, bottomed almost right on schedule right in early uh, September. This has been a I use a few different cycles in this, but the 41 week has been very, very good over the years. We saw the peak in 2018. We saw the peak in the 2021 and the late 20, uh, early 2021. And, you know, more recently, the rally into the spring, which then give way to weakness into September. Now, now this shows actually strength into right around mid to late January. Now, this doesn't necessarily, <clears throat> as you can see, based on this pink line not being magnitude, uh, this was still going up and this went sideways almost. So it doesn't need to necessarily follow that, but sometimes it can, like it did in 2021 or late 2021. So there is a possibility, and I think Ethereum personally will catch up to Bitcoin and start to show greater strength. And that's, we're going to need to watch 1900 carefully for those that care on that. But really it's a period between late January, early February and May that I think is going to be another drawdown in crypto. So I think we have to watch carefully for that. I um, won't spend too much time on that. Finally, the U.S. dollar, also similar to yields, does not show an immediate drawdown. We actually have to wait until almost the middle to the end of December before that happens, and then a very sharp pullback. So I do suspect that the BOJ is slowly starting to change their policy. They really have not done a whole lot thus far. Just a lot has just been with words and replacing hard targets with more reference points and this and that. But we haven't really had UEDA come out and say, okay, you know, deflation is over and now is an inflationary time, even though they jacked up their inflation targets in the end, obviously uh, went down pretty sharply. 
I think the dollar yen does peak out by the end of the year. I I think that, you know, most, I think that the Euro and Sterling have a pretty sharp rally early next year. And I think dollar yen comes down, but I think for now it's, it's so tough with honestly, the U S looking a much better shape than most of Europe, not only with earnings, but most of the UK residents have two to five year mortgages. They weren't able, they don't have the same terms as U S residents to lock in a 30 year at 3%. So they're facing a lot more pain in the greater scheme of things than I think uh, than we in the U.S. are. Finally, let's talk about Tesla a little bit. I covered this in a recent piece. Uh, I have a few different cycles I think are pretty accurate for this and have pinpointed a lot of the highs and the lows. Uh, It actually I did not get any sort of signals at the low for Tesla. And if anything, it's very, very short term. And it turns back down in mid-November, right back down to to almost the end of January. So I'm not all that optimistic. I honestly think that Tesla likely goes down. Um, you know, and I look at at things like, you know, if I look at, for example, DeMarc signals on numerous different time frames, uh, there's just not a lot. Momentum is negative. I don't think we've uh, shown. I will certainly respect strength if we get it, but I'm thinking that this area near 230 to 235 for those that are involved uh, likely is going to prove to be very strong. And then we're actually going to have a final washout in this. And this will form almost a perfect sort of A, B, and then one, two, three, four, five being C. And we're in four now. You notice the gap that's potentially a wave three gap. So I don't expect to move over, honestly, 230. That would surprise me, specifically over 242. And I'd say, okay, this is completely wrong and we can move back to highs. And that hasn't happened. So if you're involved in Tesla, I think the ideal area to sell uh, or to hedge uh, it's really 230 to 235. And then we're actually going to turn back down south. And we could, uh, you know, based on what weekly charts show, uh, you know, this is on a four count, we could easily get down and form a, a perfect nine count that would happen for another five weeks. So it could happen into, you know, the middle part of December. That's right when I think my stock market cycle actually bottoms. Uh, but the Tesla count, you know, should take the stock lower into February. And we just have to be respectful of the fact that you know, the broader trends broke, momentum is still negative. I respect the fact that sure, it's a short term bounce, but uh, I don't think it's going to last, unfortunately. So I am sort of negative on Tesla between now and December and really potentially into February and thinking we can actually get down and challenge, you know, levels near 164 under that would bring, you know, potentially, I don't think we get down to 142 to 150, but that that can't be ruled out. This stock is far more volatile than, than most and, uh, you know, I, I certainly respect that, uh, you know, Musk's vision and, and uh, you know, the bottom line is that after we bottom, look at what this chart does next year for Tesla. So it moves up into almost April. So this is January to April. So I think that's the time you want to be long Tesla. There was a question on here. What do you think of all these stocks would be the best performer between year end? Uh, I don't think Tesla is going to be that. It could do well in the next week but I don't think it's going to be the outperformer. Um, the other ones were, I think, Clack and Avago, Broadcom. So, you know, this still looks very good to me. It's been a sideways pattern, but certainly the broader chart is in really good shape. So I still like uh, KLA quite a bit. It would be long KLA and uh, certainly over, you know, levels near almost 507 would be a really constructive move for that stock. But it's, it's still one of my top stocks within the uh, the entire uh, space. The other one, you know, Broadcom is very similar pattern has been sideways almost since June, but the, the broader pattern is still great. So both those stocks are almost uh, equal in my view. Uh, CDNS is a really strong stock. I consider it to be stronger than, than either one of them. And I would be long this. I think that CDNS uh, for my nickel, you know, lines up a lot better. The, the broader chart and the construction, the technical structure is just excellent in that. Of course, that is you know, a super granny that we picked for Tom's list. And uh, I, I, I still highly recommend that. Outside of that, let's talk about NVIDIA a little bit. I know a lot of people have uh, an interest in this, and this has been something that snapped back rather violently. Let's just take a look at what, you know, everybody in the world was watching the stock and also watching the so-called head and shoulders pattern that, you know, we broke it for about two days and then it immediately was recouped. So, you know, the stock Honestly, I think it's going to be range bound between now and late November, but I, I think it's a real positive that we, you know, didn't break down under this level on really a weekly basis. It was just, you know, a couple of days and then we charged right back up above it. So it's a, yesterday was a clear positive and having broken the downtrend line a lot. So 
In general, though, I don't expect to see NVIDIA back to new highs right away. And if anything, I think the next week provides a chance for those that care. Uh, you know, anything up above 445, 450 is probably going to be a little bit more high risk on uh, NVIDIA. And I say that purely from a shorter term technical perspective. Long term, you know, it's been a great stock. I would just, yes, it has gotten overbought. This momentum churning has caused momentum to turn down, which is normally the case when you see an extended move that then goes sideways. But, you know, you can't really be too bearish on this. Sort of 98 out of 100 times, normally you see these consolidation patterns end up being just, just that. They're neutral churning patterns, and then we break out to the upside. So for those that care on that, I mean, what you need to watch is really any evidence of any uh, move up back up above that uh, 476 level. And right now it's only at 434. So that requires almost a 10% rally just to even get that breakout. So, you know, this is the pattern since June. It is pretty, pretty choppy and neutral. But yeah, certainly yesterday was was very positive. And today also open gap up and, uh, you know, that could allow it to extend a little bit more into uh, next week. Uh, let's talk about tan a little bit. So all these alternative energy, the solar energy have been really affected by interest rates. And, uh, you know, my thinking of rates potentially peaking in December through February doesn't mean that I think TAN is probably the best uh, vehicle to hold into year end, particularly if rates, you know, go back to new highs. I think that's going to be very bearish for TAN. Uh, initially, I think that any bounce in the next week up to levels near 45 to 45 and a half are likely going to be very strong resistance. That's still a good percentage move from where we are at 43. But uh, bigger scheme of things, um, you know, it's just very difficult to pick a bottom and something like that. We saw substantial deterioration in this. And this is really, really important when you look at patterns going back since 2020 that are broken and volume increased. I and mean, I think we might have noted that in, in August that this picked up on the breakdown to the highest level we've seen almost all year. So a huge decline in that. And uh you know, I've taken, you know, assorted stabs on clean energy throughout the year at various times, but they've always proven to be very short lived and they've never really worked out. And I, I think the same this time. I don't sense that we're going to break out. And I honestly, uh, I'm still very cautious on that until we see some evidence of trend improvement. Uh, SRV. So this is a very different animal. It moves quite unlike almost many things. Uh, a lot of the MLP uh, pipeline stuff that pays the big dividends, uh, certainly, you know, it tends to be this one in particular, very low volume. So it's not going to be something I really care to offer any sort of meaningful technical insight on. Uh, the only thing I'd say is that we did have a pretty uh, formidable five wave advance. And whenever you see that happening, uh, typically it tends to be high risk, even though the chart tends to look great. Uh, so when we see breaks of longer term uptrends like that, it's almost always important. Multiple months of uptrend breaks, almost always more important than taking a look at a 50 or a 200 and thinking that's important whatsoever. So I think in the near term, the action in the last couple of days is actually pretty negative in this. Uh, if I had to specifically just go based on this, I think we are probably going to revisit these lows. Uh, let's take a look at WTI crude real quick, just because, you know, I am sort of negative on, on crude and I'll tell you the reasons why. Uh, first of all, we saw momentum really start to roll over during seasonally the worst time of the year. So August, uh, October, November, you know, those two months are some of the worst for crude. You tend to see a lot happening with different inventories. And in this case, the demand, uh, you know, maybe it's a perception, maybe it's reality of, of the war. But but uh, certainly, um, you know, demand for this time of the year was one of the lowest it's been in 25 years. That's important. And uh, supply. You know, I, I tend to be long term bullish crude. I think that this has started a new bull market back three years ago in March. But I suspect that this is going to be sort of a three wave type decline in crude. And so honestly, I'm looking for a move down into, you know, almost the mid 70s. And this would be really an area 76 would be a great spot. Anywhere lower would make for a very attractive risk reward for energy, in my view. Uh, when I look at relative charts of, you know, how I see energy, for example. Uh, so let's just take a look at equal weight energy versus equal weight S&P. You see that the monthly counts are still very, very early. Uh, daily basis, you know, these are suggesting that at least a short-term low is in, but I just don't know on a weekly basis. And I'm a little bit sort of skittish that this is, uh, 
you know, momentum is starting to roll over a little bit. I could see this pull back a little bit over the next month. And that directly lines up with that, that uh, crude oil uh, chart that shows, you know, the cycle likely persisting until the end of November before we turn higher. So uh, something to keep in mind there for those that are long energy. Uh, you really want to watch, I think, on any sort of break under 80. And that would be specifically quite negative for, uh, for crude oil. Uh, let's move on. So Oracle, this has been a, a you know, a question that somebody asked and, and, you know, I, I do like most of the software. I like Adobe. I like Oracle. I think they're better. I think they make more sense between now and, uh, you know, potentially if we see this longer term trend break, uh, that could be very, very bullish. So I just looked at, and I'll show you real quick what I was looking at, uh, to make that call, but, you know, this is just a chart of what IGV looks like, the old software index, it's very heavily involved in, um, you know, Microsoft, obviously a lot of the key. And so we're really at the verge of breaking almost a four year downtrend. And the reason I like it is really what happened to momentum on a weekly and monthly basis. You look at how this made lower lows and we saw some severe positive divergence in momentum. That's normally a very, very good sign. Um, any sort of washout and semis between now and December would cause this breakout to really be very plain for anybody to see and would certainly favor software. And given that it's a four year move, one could definitely make the case that software could start to show some outperformance, which really as of now, uh, you know, every little rally we attempt we've had in the recent years has been short lived. But stocks like Microsoft, I mean, it's just tough. Yesterday we saw into the Fed meeting, eight sectors were down and yet, you know, S&P showed positive gains of one to one and three quarters percent. A lot of that was QQQ it was all fang, magnificent seven. You look at Microsoft attempting to break out to the highest level of all time. Very, very bullish. That has a huge impact on our indices. And so, you know, the RSPT was actually flat, whereas the XLK was up about 100 points, 100 basis points better than that. So that's really, really important. So Microsoft is, is hands down my top stock within the Magnificent Seven. I think that's a great uh, stock. Apple, you know, I talked about last night, I would encourage uh, subscribers that missed that to please go and read my comments on that. I'll just simply say a couple comments about that. You know, ever since the stock had rallied, we saw a rally from, you know, January the 3rd up to J July, right around the 16th, we did see weekly counter trend sells. The decline has been very choppy and overlapping, which actually gives me a lot of confidence that we will push back to new highs for Apple into next year. Uh, the stock does have some work to do. I thought we'd get to 179 and then stall out. Uh, I guess my real issue with that is really the extent to which momentum has been rolling over in Apple. And when I look at like monthly charts, uh, let's see, bear with me one second. This is the software is, uh, it's not, it's not cooperating. Let's see. So we did get monthly sales in Apple you know, right at the peak. And there's another 11 count. You look at the extent to which momentum waned on the move to new highs. That always is really important to take a look at. MACD, RSI, you get similar divergences. That's really the main way I use momentum. It's not like, oh, something is oversold or overbought. So we got to gotta sell it because it's overbought. Uh, it's more to find these intermediate term divergences and momentum that really usually can be quite positive. So Apple has crossed back over to negative. It's made a... <coughs> You know, MACD has crossed over the signal line to the downside, a bearish crossover. Um, that being said, the stock maintains a pretty decent longer term uptrend. Very, very positive. So, you know, ideally how this should unfold is a rally into next week and then probably another drawdown. Anything under 165 would be a negative. It likely puts this down to right near this longer term uptrend and probably gets, you know, about a 61% retracement of the uptrend just since January. That would be a very good risk reward for a move back to new highs. Uh, in general, I like Apple between now and, and really, uh, you know, late January of next year. I'll share that. Uh, I think that I think that any sort of pullback is certainly a buying opportunity, but I would look to sell Apple up between 205 and 210 on any move to new highs. That will actually allow, even on a move to new highs, unless it happens very, very quickly and right away, momentum is not going to be able to catch up. And it's just momentum is going to get weaker and weaker. So the uptrend is intact, but the stock slowly has gotten weak and momentum wise, specifically based on the decline last year. And also, you know, that really took a, a sharp downward pull on momentum that really was never recovered. 
And that's what I have uh, issues with, uh, I think, on an intermediate term basis for Apple. Uh, short term, still like the stock. Yeah, we need to break 179. Any that, that look at this know that that's going to be really an important spot for why the stock might might really show. I don't know why that's there. Let's let's just try drawing this again. So, um, you know, here's here's how it's really proper to look at Apple. You know, technically it remains trending down. This is a choppy overlapping wave. Normally that it, this isn't a peak of any magnitude given that if anything, that means that highs eventually should be revisited. So I like 179 as being key. Anything above 182.50 would certainly be a big positive for the short-term structure in Apple. But as I mentioned, it's important for this stock to get back to highs sooner than later, or else you're really going to see more and more of a rolling over in momentum. And when that intermediate term trend breaks, and that's when I think you have real issues with the S&P given Apple size, I don't think that's between now and, and year end. Uh, I think that any sort of drawdown is quick and short-lived and likely should be over within about six weeks. Uh, let's uranium. So yeah, that's interesting. Here's a question on, so uranium has slowly, but surely played catch up There's a, there's a ton of different ways to sort of play, uh, uranium. I'm not sure why, uh, this is not capturing it. Let me try just looking at this. There's a bunch of these, some of the physical uranium, uh, ETFs, um, you know, big giant base and, and, and huge breakout move back in August, consolidated, minor consolidation, now turning back up. I, I'm positive on this. I think that it actually moves up to challenge, if not take out those highs, that's 2777. It should allow it to move up above 31. Uh, when we get there, I think that's, you know, in the bigger scheme of things, that's, that's an important level, but look how far down it came just over the last, you know, decade. And, uh, CCJ, of course, uh, Cameco is the, uh, you know, the stock to own within that space. And look at it uh, this week is just breaking right back out to the highest levels we've seen since uh, really 2011. That is an impressive move. So, you know, I think 40, anything in the low mid 40s, $45, probably pretty key for this. But uh, in the bigger scheme of things, that, that's actually a very bullish pattern. I think we do get back to the mid fifties and test that and, and CCJ. So I like that a lot. Metals, you know, are going to have a lot of appeal. We did see short-term breakouts and many things, including platinum and, and some aluminum. Uh, I think copper is very heavily tied to China. That's going to prove tough until we really see evidence of China truly bottoming out. And we just haven't really seen that. I'll speak about that a little bit because that's also been a source of frustration for many uh, bulls. And, uh, you know, we do have a meeting with, uh, with Xi and Biden in, in mid-November. And I think that's going to be a very important time to really watch for potential change of trend in FXI. Uh, whatever is said behind closed doors, I would just watch the price of this. And if we see movement in Chinese tech or FXI, uh, certainly any, any breakout here would be important. You know, until the dollar really starts to break down sharply and my dollar cycle chart says that's going to happen next year, you know, it's going to be really difficult to favor emerging markets and really expect they show all that much longevity in their rallies. And so, you know, I know we saw a really good movement. Look at what's happening with Latin America today. And specifically, that's a great move for, for the ILF. That's the, you know, the ETF that, that encompasses uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina. So I think that EWW, you know, is really probably one of the stronger areas. And that's Mexico. That's been a intermediate term, just a monster compared to Brazil. Brazil has been very tough to really own. But uh, we did see, you know, Mexico almost bottom exactly where it needed to at 54 and a half. Look at that. And now it's starting to turn up again. EWZ, of course, is, is the favorite of many. Uh, <clears throat> relatively weaker here, has not made its move yet. What I would look for here, for those that care, is going to be really a move up above 33 and a quarter. So set your alerts for that. When that does happen, that would be meaningful. That would be a three-year downtrend breakout and certainly very, very important. Okay, we have about 20 minutes. I've covered TLT, I've covered Tesla, I've covered, uh, let's talk about QQQ and similar to S&P. You know, momentum is still quite negative here, but you look at the structure of this move and I still tend to be very positive on that. So I look at it in two ways. One is that, you know, similar to Apple, and this chart is almost a, a you know, a spitting image of, of really what's happening in Apple. Uh, we've seen 
a pattern of lower highs and lower lows, uh, this area should be really key for it. And that's right near, you know, 368 to 369. Uh, I do not get a sense that we're going to get up above 374 right away. So movement up to here would make me want to, you know, from a trading perspective, you want to take profits or, or hedge. Uh, and really, obviously, if it breaks out, that would be sort of all bets are off. That means that FANG comes in stronger than expected and can carry the whole market up. And, you know, FANG has been. I want to show you a couple of different charts. This is interesting. So look at the difference between XLK. So this is really, really a strong, a pretty strong chart. This is basically Apple and Microsoft. Look at how, uh, look at how strong that is. Now look at equal weighted technology and look what's happened here. We're not even above early October lows. That is a really negative overall, much, much more negative for how we view equal weighted technology. And so on an absolute basis, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. This isn't FANG. This is how everything, you know, semis, software, hardware, when you strip out the largest pieces, uh, we are in much, much worse shape across the board in many things. And, uh, you know, this area is going to be important, I think, for tech. We really want to see this uptrend recover. That would be certainly very positive. You know, I, I don't have any natural inclination to have to lean one way or the other, but but I, I do uh, you know, from my writings, I've, I've discussed that I think markets will higher in the next week. And I think we probably face a period of volatility. And that, of course, should be uh, should be viable. So, uh, you know, QQQ, I sense that any sort of pullback into uh, late <coughs> November, early December, where you'd be better than probably trying to reach for it here. Um, despite the fact that some of the sentiment polls have grown bearish, we certainly did not see much capitulation. We didn't see the traditional you know, dispersion and volume, very heavy volume on the downside or, or the kind of VIX backwardation that normally occurs at lows or the very, you know, the high trend prints or any of those. And so, you know, the CFTC data for large speculators shows them now back to positive. So, you know, it, it's interesting. Some of the, the, the CTAs have rapidly increased their exposure and it's, it's unusual when they catch moves in a choppy market like that. They're notorious trend followers and they're, they're, the trend has been all over the place since July. It's been a very difficult market to be trend follower. Um, so, you know, I think they're going to be proven to be wrong over the next month. And then when they go to short again, that's probably going to mark the bottom and that's probably a month away. Uh, let's talk about XLE. I did mention, of course, um, you know, energy potentially being weak. Uh, we certainly have held where we needed to for the time being. So that's really your, your stop or your your area of key concern, and that's going to be $84. 84.16, I believe, was really the low, 84.09. So I think it's going to be neutral, if anything, given that I think the market could be difficult. I think crude goes lower. You know, I, I think, you know, anything up between 88 and $91 probably is going to prove to be a high in that. And then you really have to watch for any sort of break in that level. That's going to provide a great buying opportunity, but I don't think... Uh, just can't say heading into November. October normally is a very bearish month for crude, and we were down about 8%. And now November usually is down, what, 4% or so on average? So just, just tough to trust it after some of the momentum weakness of late. Google, uh, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, I do not like this as much as Microsoft. And, you know, if I can just share that we saw a really big expansion of volume on this big break of the trend line going back really since March of this year. So that's a big negative in late October, a much, much different chart than what we see in Microsoft. Those charts used to be pretty much the same. Right now, Amazon looks a lot better. And, uh, you know, honestly, Apple looks better. And Microsoft is probably the best of all. Meta, I'll talk about that because that has, you know, promptly recovered uh, a lot of its break. And that has been also, you know, I do own Meta. I think that that is a, it's a phenomenal uh, Based on the fundamental sources, it appears to be fundamental long term uh, or, or, or phenomenal in terms of long term. And, and many people that I know fundamentally that study it say it's quite cheap. But uh, yeah, you have to be, I think, a little bit cautious in November. I would suspect that we could stall out a little bit and then this might weaken. So any any sort of weakness over the next month is going to be something I like buying in Meta. This probably is just a giant triangle pattern that eventually gets broken to the upside. And uh, very, very difficult to say anything else than that. Pulte. So a lot of the home builders are trying to carve out lows. I know that, uh, wow, this has really gotten ahead of uh, 
So the ITB, the XHB, uh, you know, both of those had really pulled back to almost, you know, right near pretty important levels and then had tried to bottom out. So this initially had bottomed right near $48 in June and rallied up to almost 90. Go figure, an almost exact doubling of price. That's almost always key. One should always be on the lookout for doubling, tripling of prices. But yeah, the double or even moving down one half of, of where a stock makes on an absolute basis. I always look at retracement levels. Fibonacci is important, but 50% is even more important, both on absolute retracements, like 50% from the highs. You can look at 0.618 Fibonacci of the absolute high. That will give you very, very good turns. Uh, in this case, we see that, you know, there was nothing really from last June. But, you know, when you look at, you know, you're right close to a 50% retracement and uh, from really last October to July. So this happened to be, you know, coincidentally, 50% in time and almost so 50% in price. So price and time aligned. And, uh, you know, we've seen a big, big move off the lows thus far. That's a that's a very nice move. And, uh, you know, I think it might take time to get back to the highs, but I do respect what this has done. I think this is probably, this move is complete. And this is probably the first move off the lows. So I would I would wait for weakness and then buy into that for most of the builders, including uh, PHM, unless people have very short time frames. Uh, so this is another interesting one. We, we had votes for this last month to uh, Churchill Downs. Um, this is not really going to be that appealing to me until we get up above 116. It looks like it's going to get there within a couple of days. So uh, volume, though, I don't really love the volume on this move compared to prior occasions. Even then, you know, back in mid-September, it proved to be a farce. It really just didn't really work. But above 116 is important because it clears all these former highs. It obviously, you know, surpasses the downtrend. That's always what we want to see to be bullish. Um, you know, it looks to be churning in the short run. I can't, I can't take today's move and think that this definitely has to break out. But I would say that above 116, I certainly like this a lot more. Uh, FCX. So Freeport is largely following the move in copper, which has proven to be a massive disappointment this year. I thought copper would have a move back to highs. Uh, the charts for China into next year are really, really bullish. So I think that that likely means that something happens that causes China to start to move up and any sort of increase in demand, you know, basically, you know, if China starts to rally sharply, China's decline has been predominantly a lot of the reason why I think our own inflation has fallen in half. It hasn't really been the effect of the interest rate hikes because that, you know, our own economy has been quite resilient. We haven't really seen a whole lot of evidence. Of that. I mean, we're, we're seeing it. We did see some manufacturing PMI dip in the ADP numbers. It's a gradual process uh, where all these rate hikes all of a sudden kick in. But uh you know, I, I think the rates pulling back along with any sort of reacceleration, reacceleration stimulus from China, uh, you know, could get copper going and, and really could get FCX going. So I, I do like this. It held where it sort of needed to back from uh, May at $33. I do think it rallies up to probably 37, 38, and it could be choppy. This is a level it needs to get above is almost 38 because that would actually help it reclaim that uptrend line and also re reclaim former lows. So whenever you see one, you know, two or three different areas intersecting that have importance, um, it definitely raises the probability that you really want to pay attention to that very, very carefully. And so for a free port, that level is uh, uh, really 38. I talked about gold already, but I'll just briefly uh, go over the gold trust. You know, I expect that it gets up towards, this is going to be key is 191 and a half. This lines up, you know, right near prior highs. Uh, I do sense that's going to be taken out into uh, December. So I do like gold here. Triple M. Um, this has been an extraordinarily weak stock. And, and yes, it is showing signs of short-term bottoming. Uh, it's done a lot of short-term bottoming and it's never proven to be all that effective. So let's talk about what needs to happen to think that Triple M is finally bottoming. Um, you know, on a short-term basis, one can certainly make the claim that that this move is is important. My thinking is that this is setting up for a five-wave decline. Uh, so we've seen three waves. This is wave four. Unfortunately, that means that I don't think that one, let's see, 97.70, it's at 92. Any move to like 96, 97 is going to be very strong resistance, I think, for this. And then it's going to have a final flush which likely takes us down into late November, December. That's a time you want to buy. If we see 
Any move to new lows, that would be a five wave decline from July. That would be the time to buy, honestly, even though the technicals look awful in this on an intermediate term basis, that would be sort of the final washout. And that is what I'm expecting. I don't think that this breaks out right away. And uh, any sort of bounce in Triple M would certainly be something I would still use to uh, to hedge, to uh, certainly avoid buying. I'll talk about OIH quickly, even though I talked about XLE. And I think a lot of that's going to be the same trade over the month, next month, which is probably down. So churning, churning uh, since July, not really a lot of weakness, but I do sense that we're going to pull back between now and December. I would certainly buy any sort of dips down to 280, up to really 290. I think that's a really nice sweet spot for OIH. Boeing. And so Boeing, actually a pretty decent, uh, you know, here also, you are really right at a very key uh, downtrend and not to mention you have a wall of overhead supply that's right there near prior spring lows. So the, the Boeing has rallied. It's been a great rally uh, in the last uh, you know week, but now nearing an area where I think it probably does not get up above 200 right away. If that did, that would surprise me. That would certainly be something to, to consider owning it. But uh, I think this is still churning and still tough to make heads or tails. So I don't like it much from a risk reward standpoint here. ANET, let's talk about that. Similar to CDNS, uh, there's a reason why this is a super granny. Technically, this this really hits on all fronts. Really, really great company and uh, a super technical candidate within this space. So this week is really you know back to new all time highs. Really, really good action. Uh, prefer to buy dips at this point if you don't own it. It's had a surge this week, but certainly. One that you have to, I think, if you're going to own stocks in the space, it certainly should be one you take a look at. All right, that's all I have time we have. We've gone about five minutes over. Thank you so much for your uh, patience and interest in my work. For those that are new, I do a daily video, which is about five to seven minutes every day, along with a, a, a pretty lengthy report. And so I hope people that are involved uh, enjoy that. I want to wish everybody a very happy holiday season in advance. I'm not sure if we're doing a December uh, call or not. I think uh, Carrie had told us that this might be the final one. If so, then we'll certainly catch up in early January to review the charts because a lot will have happened by then. Um, if markets truly sell off in a very vicious fashion, I might try to figure out a way to get a call in. But but otherwise, I'll see everybody after the holidays and have a wonderful uh, uh holiday season and happy new year. And uh, thank you as always. Take care, everybody. Bye.